1865, the Industrial Revolution, an economist called William Stanley Jevons notices something rather strange regarding efficiency innovations. James Watt had just introduced his steam engine, which was significantly more efficient than previous versions. It used less coal per unit of output. Everyone assumed that this would reduce total consumption of coal. But oddly enough, exactly the opposite happened. Coal consumption in England soared. The reason, Jevons discovered, was that the efficiency improvement saved money, and capitalists reinvested the savings to expand production. This led to economic growth, and as the economy grew, it needed more coal, therefore increasing coal mining, exploitation of miners, and pollution. This odd result became known as the Jevons paradox. In modern economics, the phenomenon is known as the Kazum Brooks postulate, named after the two economists who described it in the 80s. And it doesn't just apply to energy. It applies to material resources too. When we innovate more efficient ways to use energy and resources, total consumption may briefly drop, but it quickly rebounds to an even higher rate. Why? Because companies use the savings to reinvest in ramping up more production. In the end, the sheer scale effect of growth swamps even the most spectacular efficiency innovations. Jevons described this as a paradox, but if you think about it, it's not particularly surprising when the main goal of the economy is growth. Under capitalism, growth-oriented corporations, private or public, do not deploy new and more efficient technologies just for fun. They deploy them in order to facilitate growth. This is why we see that, despite constant improvements in efficiency, aggregate energy and resource use has been rising for the whole history of capitalism. And there's an important lesson here for the war against the climate apocalypse. The notion that continuous efficiency improvements will somehow magically lead to an absolute decoupling of economic growth and material and energy consumption is empirically and theoretically baseless. But there's also something else going on. The technological innovations that have contributed most to growth have done so not because they enable us to use less nature but because they enable us to use more. Take the chainsaw, for instance. It's a remarkable invention that enables loggers to cut trees, let's say, 10 times faster than they are able to do by hand. Might be more, might be less, but bear with me. The important thing is the essence of the argument. Logging companies equipped with chainsaws don't let their workers cut the same amount of trees they would have with an axe in less time, finishing their jobs early and then take the rest of the day off. They get them to cut down 10 times as many trees as before, and probably they won't pay them more. Lashed by the growth imperative, Technology is used not to do the same amount of stuff in less time, liberating humanity from labor, but rather to do more stuff in the same amount of time, trapping people even further in the eternal wheel of production, without proper compensation too. That they can decouple quite easily. The steam engine, the cotton gin, fishing trawlers. These technologies have contributed so spectacularly to growth not because money springs forth from them automatically, but because they have enabled capital to bring even greater swaths of nature into production, requiring even a larger workforce to exploit. This even applies to the seemingly immaterial digital economy. Innovations like Facebook's or Google's algorithms, for example, contribute to growth by allowing advertisers to get more people to consume things they wouldn't otherwise, things that require material production and energy. Once we grasp how this works, it should come as no surprise that despite centuries of extraordinary innovation, energy and resource use keeps going up. In a system where technological innovation is leveraged to expand extraction and production, it makes little sense to hope that yet more technological innovation will somehow magically do the opposite. And this wouldn't be a problem if the world was an infinite orchard of abundance. But it's not. Scientists are beginning to realize that there are physical limits to how efficiently we can use resources. Sure, we might be able to produce cars and iPhones and skyscrapers more efficiently, but we can't produce them out of thin air. We might shift the economy to services such as yoga and movies, but even work at studios and cinemas require material inputs. There is always a limit to how lightweight a product can be. And once we approach that limit, then continued growth causes resource use to start rising again. This question was recently studied in detail by a team in Australia led by the scientist James Ward. They ran a series of models with extremely optimistic rates of technological innovation, well beyond what scientists consider to be feasible and faster than anything even green growth proponents have ever proposed. What they found is that while they were able to achieve some reductions in resource use in the short term, in the longer term, resource use started rising again, recoupling with the rate of growth. The team states that their findings constitute a robust rebuttal of the claim of absolute decoupling. It is worth quoting their conclusion, as it has become quite famous in the field of ecological economics. We conclude that the coupling of GDP growth from resource use, whether relative or absolute, is at best only temporary. Permanent decoupling, absolute or relative, is impossible for essential non-substitutable resources, 
because the efficiency gains are ultimately governed by physical limits. Growth in GDP ultimately cannot plausibly be decoupled from growth in material and energy use, demonstrating categorically that GDP growth cannot be sustained indefinitely. It is, therefore, misleading to develop growth-oriented policy around the expectation that decoupling is possible. Let's be clear, technological innovation is vital to battle climate collapse. We're going to need any and all innovations and efficiency improvements we can get to drastically reduce the resource and carbon intensity of our economy. But the problem we face doesn't have to do with technology. The problem has to do with growth. Over and over again, we see that the growth imperative wipes out all the gains our best technology delivers. We tend to think of capitalism as a system that incentivizes innovation. And let's be honest, in many senses, it does. But paradoxically, the potential ecological benefits of innovation are constrained by the logic of capital itself. For example, solar panels are great. But if we produce as many solar panels as to supply for the energy demand that now is supplied by fossil fuels, and we pretend to grow that demand by 3, 5 or 10 percent every year, we would need so much extraction of materials and exploitation to produce them that we would eventually end up as bad as with fossil fuels. But it doesn't have to be this way. If we build and advocate it for different kinds of economies, it doesn't need to be one monolithic model. Economies not organized around growth, our technological innovations would have an opportunity to work as we expect them to. In a post-growth economy, efficiency improvements would actually reduce our impact on the planet and would actually liberate us to do whatever we want with most of our time. And once we are liberated from the growth imperative, we will be free to focus on different kinds of innovations. Innovations designed to improve human and ecological welfare, rather than innovations designed to speed up the rate of extraction and production to benefit a few. If you want to know more, read Less is More by Jason Hickel and follow me for more. Bye.